Now, if a week is a long time in politics, this one must have felt like something of a lifetime for Rishi Sunak. He faced the COVID inquiry. Uh, he then staved off a backbench rebellion. And it's likely that there is another by-election coming his way. Yes, another one. Another one. And that is because MP Scott Benton faces suspension from Parliament over a very serious breach of standards rules, meaning that a by-election could be called in Blackpool South. Joining us now is our political correspondent, uh, Alicia Fitzgerald. Um, I'd forgotten that the COVID inquiry was only this week. <laughs> Alicia, <laughs> it feels like a long time ago and so much has happened uh, there. But it's not an easy run up to Christmas. Uh, for Rishi Sunak and January is going to be very challenging indeed. Yeah, this has definitely been probably one of the most challenging weeks in Rishi Sunak's premiership since he entered number 10. We've had that big crunch vote from Miranda at the start of the week. He obviously was at the COVID inquiry as well. And it's just been more disaster after disaster. And then that news yesterday that Scott Benton, MP for Blackpool South, might be facing a by-election. The Conservatives have already lost four of their seats to by-elections this year. Some of those absolutely catastrophically Selby and Ainsty they and in Tamworth they overturned 20,000 vote majorities which is pretty history making stuff and yeah, this absolutely. is a small majority isn't it yeah it is 4,000 or thereabouts isn't yeah it? I think it's a bit less than that actually it's it's a really not a safe seat for the Conservatives at all it was held by Labour from 97 to 2010 so it, it does seem like it may well swing back that way again now and of course Peter Bone in Wellingborough suspended for six weeks that ban expired last week the recall petition is still open I believe till December the 19th um, and, and you need 10% of the people to vote for that to, to obviously cause a by-election. Rishi Sunak, I said this earlier he faced a nightmare before Christmas he's going to have New Year horror show going forward, he's got this to deal with also Rwanda, it's fascinating that no one actually, none of the Tories voted against that but obviously the Star Chamber now trying to get into cahoots in some ways to change uh, that legislation as it goes through the various processes, they want to toughen it up, don't they? Definitely. I mean, the battle is far from being over with the Rwanda policy. Sunak has effectively just bought himself a bit more time to try and get his MPs on side, but he really just faces the same issue that he faced on Tuesday. He's got those on the right of the party saying they want it tougher, they want a bit of more of a hardline approach, and those who are in the more centrist, moderate um, wing of the Conservative Party saying that they won't accept any amendments that make the bill tougher. So he really is caught between a rock and a hard place. Mm. Uh, John Curtis, the polling guru, with a pretty bleak outlook for the Tories in terms of election wipeout, mm. uh, now he's suggesting on the cards, and talking about a divided party, which the Tory party very much is on the issue of immigration, never doing well when it comes to the polls. Well, this is it. So we've got this issue of the party being split into so many different factions mm. and the Conservatives mm. call themselves a broad church of opinion, but there's only so much that the public mm. will tolerate with that. If you've got one side of the MPs saying something completely different to other people in the same party, the public will wonder what the direction of the party what does is. What party stand exactly. for? Exactly. And then we have other issues like these by-elections. They really don't help public feeling that the party are secure and that they have a clear direction on what they want to do in the next election. Well, I think that's right. And also, just coming into that election, and I've said this repeatedly, this is going to be about immigration. This is what people are absolutely furious about. When you look at all the things that the government has tried to implement, so the Bibby Stockholm, for example, I looked at the numbers. Just It's costing a fortune, even the Bibby Stockholm, the idea to get people out of those hotels and into other accommodation. I mean, clearly there's an asylum backlog. They need to sort that out. The public don't believe they're on top of this. And I think to win, or at least have, stand a chance at this election, Rishi Sunak needs to show leadership in terms of immigration. Definitely. So m migration and immigration, whichever one you want to call it, is seen by the public as a really important issue. The majority of the public believe that the figures do need to come down and that the, the, the big rise in figures recently has been the cause of a lot of issues we have in the country. Those numbers don't necessarily translate to the popularity of the measures that Rishi Sunak is introducing, mm. though. The Rwanda scheme, for example, lots of people think is a massive waste of money. They don't see it being effective because, let's remember, not a single migrant has actually gone to Rwanda yet and a lot of money has been spent £300 on it. million. Pounds. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. It's £100 million per Home Secretary that's visited. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, we had um, lots of journalists had drinks with Keir Starmer last night, just in his annual oh, kind of were Christmas. Were you there for the carols? Christmas thing. <laughs> I wasn't there for the carols. This was in Parliament. But he actually made reference to the fact that more of the journalists had been to Rwanda than any migrants, which did get a few laughs. And it is actually true, sadly.
But I mentioned the carols because it was a, a rather unusual um, carol singing rendition outside Sir Keir Starmer's house yesterday. What happened? Yes, there was a just, just Up Oil. I know it's everyone's favourite favourite thing to talk about, Just Up Oil. And um, they did a rather more, I don't know if you could say this, funny approach to their um, climate activism yesterday. They turned up outside Keir Starmer's house, probably less funny for Keir Starmer. I just may want to preface that. Um, and they sang Christmas carols um, littered with their kind of climate message in the words and they were dispersed by the police. I don't think any further severe action has been taken. They've just been warned that they can't do it again and can't return or they will be arrested. And let's just move on the front page of the eye this morning. Uh, interest rates may have to rise next year. This is the Bank of England. Uh, people are feeling desperately poor at the moment. I think they are splashing out for Christmas, but obviously interest rates held at 5.25%. Rishi Sunak, again, this is one of his big pledges to halve inflation, mm. which it has gone down, of course, so it's sitting around 4.6%. Many people are saying, well, this has nothing to do with government policy, but unless they control this by the time of the election, we then have immigration out of control, inflation out of control, people won't like that. No, and Rishi Sunak very much took credit for halving inflation, but his critics will argue that actually it was the Bank of England that halved inflation. They are the ones who increased the interest rates, and that is seen as the most effective way to bring inflation down, is by increasing interest rates. You kind of deter people from spending, and the less money that is just being spent and injected into the economy means that people do tend to save more and spend less, and that usually is just a very kind of simplistic way of explaining how that works. And, and Rishi Sunak has also, you know, pinned his electoral hopes on growth in the economy and tax cuts. Yes, he has. He's chosen two very, very big hills to die on, and that is illegal migration and economy growth. Our economy has flatlined for the past few months, slash shrink, shrunk prior to that, and migration, the figures are pretty much higher than ever. So he's got a lot of work to do. So, so can I just ask you, what will he be doing over Christmas, apart from reading Chili Cooper, in terms of he will be deciding... <laughs> I'm slightly obsessed Cooper? by You that. are obsessed by Chili <laughs> um, Cooper this But just morning. in terms of that, I mean, when does he call this election? There, there are a number of trains of thought here. Does he go early or wait for the local elections, in which case there may be a massive drumming? Does he hold out for the latest possible time, hoping that actually everyone feels better in the summer, that maybe inflation comes down, maybe immigration comes down? I mean, is it cross your fingers and hope time? There are a lot of ideas that he is playing with, and obviously another option is potentially have a new leader, a new Conservative leader, which uh, don't, I know that facial expression, I think, sums <laughs> up how everyone Five in five years, yeah. We've had an awful lot of those, but lots of people think that the only way the Conservatives could have a chance at the next election is to replace the leader. Lots of people will say that that is just ludicrous. We've had so many in such a short space of time, and we have to have a general election before January 2025 by law. So realistically, within the next year, we have to have an election Lots of people are saying maybe May kind of time seems pretty realistic, but Rishi Sunak is a man with a lot of pride. He's not one to often put his hands up and say, do you know what, I haven't done so well in this particular instance, let's just do this or that. He usually does mm. like to stick it out till the very last possible moment, so we'll have to wait and see. Maybe an autumn election isn't off the cards. And what do the grassroots think? Do they want a new leader? It's very divided, and this Rwanda issue really hasn't helped at all. Lots of the One Nation Conservatives, those are the more centrist ones, are a bit more happy with Rishi Sunak recently because of his slight shift more towards the centre. That was with that big cabinet reshuffle where we saw David Cameron come back, for example, and obviously we got rid of Suella Braverman. So that has slightly pleased those towards the centre. Those towards the right, however, it's a different story. Elissi, one other group uh, not happy with Rishi Sunak, disabled rights campaigners mm. who feel that their rights are being kind of pushed into the long grass. Yes, well, that was with this news that the Minister for Disabled People is actually being a downgraded job. It's something that Downing Street have actually denied, but technically that is exactly what is happening. So before it was the Minister of State for Disabled People. Now it's just going to be the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State. Sorry for the Parliament jargon there. But the best way of describing that is that the Minister of State is the second in command under the Secretary of State. The Parliamentary Under Secretary of State is the most junior role in the ministerial ladder, if you like. So Mims Davies, who will now be adopting that role, is just absorbing the responsibilities. It's sort of being tagged on to her existing job. Yes. So could you argue, though, that this is about inclusivity rather than singling out disabled people, or is it seen to be mm. a downgrade? That's definitely a, an argument you could use for it, but I think the general consensus here is that it is a downgrade. People often think that disabled people are super marginalised in society, and Rishi Sunak has previously had a lot of criticism for, for not really focusing on those who are just more vulnerable in society, so this definitely won't 
won't help him and his image to the public, that's for sure. Alicia, thanks so much. Lots to talk about this morning.